Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the scorching temperatures in Western Canada and the deadly consequences. Since Friday, VPD has responded to an average of 14 sudden deaths a day. Quite simply, it's uh, stretching our resources uh, very thin. Temperatures spike to nearly 50 degrees Celsius, shattering records and overwhelming emergency services. Leaking water, cracked concrete and exposed rebar. The structural problems flagged years before a horrific condo collapse in Florida. Traveler confusion as Atlantic Canada starts to open up. I don't mind following the rules to get in the province, but I just want to know what they are. Plus, after accusing her fellow police officers of harassment, she was sent to a psychologist, but she's learned he may have been an imposter and meets the real doctor. Do you recognize Dr. Freud? No, definitely not you. Do I look familiar? This is The National. The stifling heat over Western Canada right now is extreme, it is historic, and tonight we also know it is deadly. Hundreds of sudden deaths have been reported in BC since the heat wave began, and the fear is there could be more because the heat is hanging on, and not just in BC. That heat dome is shifting east, driving up temperatures in Alberta and Saskatchewan too. Warnings even extend into Manitoba and the territories. Consider yesterday, it got hotter in Lytton, BC than it has ever been in Las Vegas. And today, it got even hotter than that, setting an all-time Canadian heat record for a third straight day, topping 49 degrees Celsius. Susanna De Silva has the details. More casualties being reported by the hour. The Vancouver Police Department can't keep up, responding to one death after another. Three to four per day is the average that we attend. Since Friday, VPD has responded to an average of 14 sudden deaths a day. Quite simply, it's uh, stretching our resources uh, very thin. Today, 20 by this afternoon alone, with more than a dozen calls still in the queue. We're also dealing with family members and, and, and working to console family members who are distraught having just discovered uh, a loved one, whether it be a family member or a neighbour or somebody who's very important to them, who's tragically died. And that tragic story extends across the province. A large number of the calls that we're going to are seniors that live alone and uh, our officers are finding that when they are entering uh, the buildings, uh, the, the rooms that they're living in are in the 40 degree temperature level. The uh, large number of these sudden deaths involve seniors between the ages of 92 uh, to 70. Uh, the youngest uh, person that we have had is a 44-year-old person. Emergency crews are stretched. At one point today, there was a 45-minute wait to speak to police after calling 911. Then there is the wait for an ambulance. Up to two hours for, for high-level priority calls. Um, people are waiting, uh, you know, over an hour um, on a regular basis right now. And, and, you know, I've heard up to 12, 15 hours for non-emergency calls. And as the heat continues, families like the Haydarius have been camped out at a daytime cooling centre and fearfully checking in on grandparents after a long, hot night. The minute me, like, I wake up, I call them, hey, are you guys ready? Would you like to go to the cooling area? And to be honest... So, hey, Susanna, um, what kind of a sense do we have of the toll province-wide? Well, the BC Coroner Service now says there have been 233 sudden deaths since Friday. That's almost twice as many as the average for that same time period. And of course, all of those deaths are taxing on the entire emergency system, causing delays elsewhere. The Vancouver Police Department is redeploying officers from other departments. They're also calling people in who are on vacation right now. They're also doing things like checking in on the most vulnerable populations. That's happening across departments all over BC. But they are also telling everyone to check in on their loved ones, to check in on families members, neighbours, people who may live alone, seniors, anyone who is ill to make sure and to check regularly to make sure that they are doing well. Andrew? Okay, okay Susanna De Silva, thank you very much. Now, multiple all-time heat records were broken in Alberta as well today as the temperature there climbed past 40 degrees Celsius and everywhere people were doing what they could to stay cool. Lots of fans, lots of water, um, popsicles. <laughs> I'm eating a lot of freezies just to keep myself cool. I buy like a cool drink just to like pat myself while I'm out. Alberta has already set a new energy consumption record in this heat wave. Today, its power grid operator declared an energy emergency alert, asking people to conserve energy during the peak hours of 4 to 7 p.m. 
Now let's bring in CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff uh, from North Vancouver because Joe, with that heat dome now shifting, what can people expect over the next few days? Andrew, we're going to see a little bit of relief across the south coast. In fact, today we felt a bit of a breeze. Temperatures only got up to the low 30s in through Metro Vancouver rather than the high 30s and will come down a couple of degrees tomorrow. This is our relief. And just to put that into perspective, the heat warnings in place for Eastern Canada, these are the temperatures that you're hitting over the next couple of days. That's our relief right now, but that marine air so needed. And I want to show you this forecast because the heat dome is not going away in the BC interior after breaking yet another all time high record in Lytton. Tomorrow we won't be quite as hot still in the mid 40s and we'll keep those 40s going through Thursday uh, right across Alberta and Saskatchewan as well potentially hitting the 40s even as we head into the weekend Andrew uh, these are the temperatures that are being called the relief uh, for Western Canada it is going to remain hot right through to early next week but at least the uh, historic heat coming to an end in a couple days and and just to further underscore how serious of an issue this is I mean as if the, the heat itself didn't pose enough of a risk. There is concern about wildfires as well. This is a big story over the next 24 hours. Lightning strikes happening tonight in the BC interior where fire danger is at extreme right now. Unfortunately, I imagine new fire starts right across the province in this extreme heat as that dome shifts east and introduces some instability, Andrew. Okay, Joe, thanks for this. You're welcome. And just on this note, at least one out-of-control wildfire in B.C. has now prompted evacuation orders. Officials say the Sparks Lake fire in the B.C. interior has grown to an estimated 750 hectares. And it's forced the evacuation of several homes near Kamloops. The B.C. Wildfire Service says the fire broke out on Monday and is likely human-caused. It's one of two out-of-control fires burning in that region. In Alberta, a helicopter pilot has died while helping battle a wildfire west of Edmonton. He was 49 years old. His chopper went down last night, and his body has since been found. The 175 hectare fire is now classified as being held, meaning it's not expected to grow. The Transportation Safety Board, though, is investigating the cause of the helicopter crash. Now, search and rescue efforts continue tonight near Miami in the wake of that devastating condo collapse. The death toll now stands at 12, but many more, including four Canadians, are still unaccounted for. And as Katie Simpson explains, there is troubling new evidence coming to light about just what kind of condition the building was in before the collapse. Piece by piece, some three million pounds of concrete have been moved from this pile. Yet six days in, no additional survivors have been found. It is a very difficult scene and they are leaving no stone unturned and they're going to continue to do that. The rescue effort remains the priority, though new insight is emerging into why this tragedy may have happened. A letter written by the condo board president in April asked residents for millions of dollars to pay for repairs based on a 2018 inspection that flagged serious structural problems. The observable damage, such as in the garage, has gotten significantly worse since the initial inspection. The concrete deterioration is accelerating, it said. And these photos taken by a contractor 36 hours before the collapse show cracks in the concrete, exposed rebar and a wet floor in the pool equipment room. It's a terrible, heartbreaking tragedy. Senator Marco Rubio says while it's too early to come to any conclusions, all of this must be factored into the investigation. The most important thing now is they want to make sure that the evidence is preserved, that enough of the building and the right parts of the building are preserved so we can get a full understanding of how this happened. The tragedy has people here worried about whether their own homes are safe. I don't know, I get the chills being here. It's, it's actually sad. Lily Ermas lives in a 13-story building nearby. It makes you wonder. It truly makes you a little paranoid of uh, what, what if. You know, what about the water that goes in and leaks down when it's raining uh, that hasn't been fixed? It, it certainly makes you a little paranoid. It's not just residents here who are worried. Millions of tourists come to Florida every year, including some 3.5 million Canadians. An urgent building inspection blitz is now underway. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Surfside, Florida. The recent discoveries of unmarked graves in Kamloops and Cowessis First Nation have forced a past promise to residential school survivors back into focus. 15 years ago, the Catholic Church committed to raising $25 million in compensation for their pain and for their suffering. But fast forward to today, and it hasn't come close to reaching that target. Jason Warwick looks at the fresh anger and hurt that's causing. 
Rick Daniels and his wife Judy Grayeyes live close to Saskatoon's elaborate new Holy Family Cathedral, complete with solar-powered stained glass windows and a 53-meter high cross. Behind me is uh, one of the cathedrals here in Saskatoon, $28 million cathedral. So it's not lack of money. When it was built, Catholic churches across Canada were supposed to be raising $25 million to help Daniels and other survivors. They came up with less than $4 million. I think it's uh, refusing to take responsibility for what happened to uh, our students uh, throughout the residential school system. The federal government tried to get the Catholic Church to pay up, but in a secret court hearing in 2015, church lawyers told the judge the church had tried its best, but had no more money. The deal allowed the Catholic Church to back out if they could prove that they had given their, quote, best efforts. A judge agreed. Many of those involved in the settlement, though, say the church betrayed survivors. After everyone settled and the church committed to $25 million, they went back and effectively reneged. Yeah, they used legal trickery, legal, like, sophisticated lawyers. You know, they outgunned us, they outfoxed us. Mary Ellen Turpel Lafond and others hope the discoveries in Kamloops and Cowessis First Nation will force the church to reconsider. And they say if churches refuse, the Vatican should pay. As one of the largest landowners in the world with billions in other assets. Saskatoon Bishop Mark Hagemon admitted the response to this campaign was weak and the results were disappointing. But there are no plans nor any precedent for asking the Vatican to contribute funds. As for Rick Daniels, he says a lot of people are in pain. We've seen uh, protests uh, where uh, the cathedrals uh, and statues, uh, there have been uh, red handprints uh, on the doorways. Daniel says the Catholic Church needs to act immediately. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Saskatoon. Well, despite calls for Canada Day events to be cancelled this year, Ottawa says virtual celebrations will go ahead as planned with an emphasis on Indigenous involvement. We have started using it as, a, as an important moment for, for, for dialogue and conversation. We, we are featuring uh, Indigenous artists and musicians in ways we've never seen before uh, for, 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 for a Canada Day event. Ottawa did say it's up to individual communities to decide, though, how to celebrate the holiday. Well, as Pride Month winds down, the push to end conversion therapy heats up. The practice of trying to change someone's sexual orientation to straight is widely condemned as homophobic, abusive, and dangerous. But today, a liberal bill making it illegal failed to clear the Senate before the summer break. Travis Denrush explains what's at stake. They were screaming and like yelling in these tongues that they have. Painful I mean, memories, still vivid. Ben Rogers survived faith? conversion therapy. At 19, he says members of his church convinced him shedding his identity as a gay man was the only way to be closer to God. If this legislation had come out back then, I would have felt like there was hope. I would have felt like I didn't have to, you know, just shut myself off and try to do what I could to move forward. Rogers eventually did move forward, hopeful over the Liberal government's promise to end conversion therapy. That hope has now faded as Bill C-6 stalls in the Senate. We've been communicating with senators stressing that this is an issue of life and death. The founder of No Conversion Canada fears what a possible election call will mean for the bill if Parliament is dissolved. Conversion therapy is a confirmed form of torture and so there's no time to wait. Today, Dominic LeBlanc urged senators to pass the bill, acknowledging that won't be easy. We certainly hope the Conservatives in the Senate aren't going to frustrate the clear will uh, of the majority of elected representatives in the House of Commons. In turn, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole questioned the government's priorities, suggesting the Liberals are trying to make the bill an election issue. Mr. Trudeau preferred to try and play politics with this. That's why it's in the dying days of, of this session. And I will have a commitment that is crystal clear. We will stand up and fight for the rights of all Canadians, including the LGBTQ community. But O'Toole, who himself voted for the bill, faces resistance inside his party. I voted against conversion therapy bill. My concern has been the need for reasonable amendments to clarify the definition. We've been talking about the need to fix the definition of the bill. The Liberals have now sent out a fundraising email highlighting Conservative opposition to Bill C-6 and what many see as an attempt to keep the issue on the front burner. Travis Danraj, CBC News, Ottawa. Canada's chief public health officer says she wants to see even higher rates of vaccination before we can start relaxing rules on masks. Even though we, we have a good first dose coverage, 
we still need to, I think, go a bit higher. Um, and, and quite a number of uh, people haven't had the full vaccinations. Now, Dr. Theresa Tam didn't go so far as to give uh, an estimate of how long mask rules should stay in place, but said with the Delta variant spreading quickly, Canadians should stay cautious. As of today, more than 75% of those eligible have received at least one dose, and about a third of all eligible Canadians are fully vaccinated. Now, those vaccination rates combined with low case numbers mean other restrictions are continuing to lift across the country. Tomorrow, Nova Scotia will move to its next phase of reopening, which includes welcoming visitors from outside the Atlantic bubble. But as Kayla Hounsell explains, on the eve of the new travel rules, there is still confusion and uncertainty. The McIsaac family left Ottawa this morning, headed for Nova Scotia, but they don't know what's going to happen when they get here. I don't mind following the rules to get in the province, but I just want to know what they are. It's been very frustrating and very distressing. Nova Scotia will welcome Canadians from outside the Atlantic region beginning at 8 a.m. Wednesday. Opening up to the rest of the country does present some risk, but is one that we believe we can manage. Visitors will have to prove they've been fully vaccinated for two weeks. Those with one dose will have to isolate for seven days and get two negative test results. When I tried to use the, I guess it's called a safe check-in, um, in order to get authorization to enter the province, there was no way to do that. In fact, there's still no way to do that. The province says the form won't be available until tomorrow. For McIsaac, that's cutting it close. And my assumption is that there'll be an automatic approval and we'll get an email letting us in. But I'm not sure of that and it's not clear on the website and, and we're taking a chance. The rules are also now different for all of the Atlantic provinces. New Brunswick has been welcoming the country for nearly two weeks and only requires one dose of vaccine. Newfoundland is set to do so on July 1st and just today, PEI announced it is moving up its date for travelers from the rest of the country. We are in a, the fortunate position of being able to welcome visitors from outside Atlanta, Canada, effective July 18th. McIsaac's kids haven't seen their grandmother in two years. So regardless of the hassle, he says it'll be worth it when they finally cross that border. I'll be very happy because I love Nova Scotia so much and I miss my home. I've lived here for 30 years and I still miss it. Just one of many cross-country family reunions set to take place in the coming days. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, with daily case counts falling and nearly 80% of adults having received their first vaccine dose, British Columbia is moving to phase three of its reopening plan on July 1st. We will be lifting the orders on personal gatherings. We'll be looking at uh, increasing capacity around organized gatherings, both indoor and outdoor settings. And we'll be welcoming people from across the country, particularly people who've been immunized. So the provincial state of emergency uh, will also be lifted on Canada Day once again, and masks will no longer be mandatory, but still recommended in certain settings. Well, the federal government is forcing a steep reduction in B.C.'s commercial salmon fishing, hoping that the move will help replenish rapidly declining salmon stocks. But as Katie Nicholson tells us, not everyone's convinced. And when the fish bite, you can hear them on the bells up when they're ringing. Frank Keach has fished these waters for four decades. Some of the salmon from his boat go right here to his food truck. Or at least, that was the plan. Now with these closures, we just don't know where we stand and what we're going to do. Today, the minister responsible for fisheries and oceans announced sweeping closures to the commercial salmon fishery. 60% now shuttered for the season. We can't fish it until it's completely gone. And that's that's what we're that's where we're that's the point we're getting to. Some fear this is the beginning of the end. It's a tragic day for the industry, I think for the coast, for all British Columbians and really for Canadians. Uh, this is an industry that grew up with this province and we are now looking at very close to the end of it. But that's exactly what the move hopes to avoid buying time to allow stocks to rebound. No one measure can kind of return salmon populations to their historical numbers. It's a good first step, 
But advocates say overfishing isn't the only thing threatening salmon. Whether it's pollution, industrial runoff, uh, increased water temperatures due to climate change, obstructions like dams, um, all of that is threatening. For some, the survival of salmon is about more than industry. Salmon have always been part of our our community and uh, with all first nations up and down the coast. And um, if we lose that, we're losing part of our identity. Part of the DFO plan also involves retiring or buying back licenses, leaving some wondering what is a fair price for a livelihood. You know, what, what do you put a price tag on um, on something we've built up our whole lives? Answers like the salmon are still scarce. Katie Nicholson, CBC News. Vancouver. Well, an Ontario police officer is seeking answers after enduring a psychological evaluation she's now learned could have been fraudulent. Do you recognize Dr. Freud? No. Nice to meet you. Coming up, the mystery that has followed one woman for years and nearly ruined her career. Plus, a former CSIS member says the intelligence agency's lack of diversity is exposing Canada to domestic terrorism. I myself felt like I was being a target at CSIS. And fresh from university, a group of friends get on a school bus to hit the road. The plan is to go west. We're back in two. Welcome back. A Muslim woman who spent 15 years with Canadian intelligence at CSIS is calling attention to what she calls a major weak spot within the organization, systemic racism. And she believes it is a threat to national security. Ashley Burke shows us why. Huda McBill was among the first Canadian intelligence officers to wear a hijab. Her job was to protect the country, but she says the agency treated her like a threat. When the threat changed from uh, you know, like that foreign connection to Al-Qaeda to young uh, Muslim men. I myself felt like I was being a target in, at CSIS. McBill claims CSIS interrogated her for 10 hours about why she wears a hijab, how often she prays, her views on suicide bombings. The threat is supposed to be on the outside. Then came the deadly 2005 suicide bombings in London, England. As an Arabic speaker, McBill was asked to help the British investigation. She says she received a personal thank you from Britain's Deputy Prime Minister for her contribution. I received two really unique awards. But when she returned to Canada, McBill says her achievements were ignored and she was repeatedly passed up for promotions. Eventually, she and four colleagues filed a discrimination suit. CESA settled and later admitted there were major issues and committed to making the workplace more diverse. This former CSIS informant says the lack of diversity is a weakness. If your sources don't reflect the society that you're serving, then you're going to get bad intelligence. Right now, Canada needs good intelligence, with Muslims on edge after a deadly attack in London, Ontario. It's the reason why individuals in the Muslim community don't feel um, that they can trust the organization to tackle uh, the threats that are, uh, you know, the far right uh, threat. CSIS admits it has problems with systemic racism and harassment. In a statement, the director of CSIS says that diversity and inclusion are his top priorities. As proof, the spy agency points to its new code of conduct, improved training, and an increase in diverse recruits last year. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. As we said, Huda McBill left CSIS four years ago. She's now seeking the nomination to run as the federal NDP candidate in an Ottawa riding. Well, the Ontario government is announcing new funding for educational programs to tackle Islamophobia. Our goal is to create an inclusive education system that stands firmly against hatred and discrimination and stands in unity for inclusion and respect. The province is giving $300,000 to Muslim associations to raise awareness and support for Muslim students, families and teachers. It comes after four members of a family were killed in Ontario earlier this month in an attack police say was motivated by anti-Islamic hate. Well, there's a push to address other forms of racism in schools as well. Parents and educators say teachers need to be better equipped to deal with anti-black racism. Deanna Sumanak johnson looks at why some say existing programs aren't doing enough. She's a mom of three young children, but Chandrika Bryan has already had experiences with all kinds of teachers, including those who were sensitive to the needs of black students. 
she's always took it upon herself to even help educate her fellow teaching staff as to how to deal with the black community. But at a different school, she says other teachers weren't as attuned. There's no black representation in anything that they, they come home with. Like, I, especially for Black History Month at least, nothing. As the calls for action on anti-black racism in schools have grown over the past year, so too has the realization that teachers need more training on the subject. Many provinces already have some mandatory training in anti-black racism for educators. In Ontario, for example, teachers now have to complete an online course before the start of a new school year. But this professor of education says that doesn't go nearly far enough. That has been a system in place for hundreds of years that now has to be dislodged, named, uprooted. And so, yes, uh, a course here, a workshop there will make people feel good in the moment, but that is not going to create the lasting change that we're asking for. And that is needed. This Dean of Education agrees. He's embedding anti-racism instruction into his teacher preparation programs and courses, but he wishes more could be done. Racism is learned. It's a learned behavior for many people. It starts at childhood. He says it means having some uncomfortable conversations with aspiring and current teachers. There's a lot of people who push back because they believe you're automatically calling them a racist. And what I say is we're all complicit in a society and a structure that is embedded um, you know, and, and, and implicated in terms of racism. Tough but necessary work to equip all teachers to be able to meet the needs of all students. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the Delta variant is fast becoming the dominant strain in Canada, but will vaccines protect us? There's nothing more important to stop the spread of the Delta variant than getting that second shot. Next on The National, Dr. Gupta sums up what we know about the variant. So we have all heard plenty about the Delta variant at this point, but there are still so many questions about it. What exactly is so concerning about it and just how effective are vaccines against it? Well, we asked respirologist Dr. Samir Gupta to walk us through everything we need to know. The Delta variant, what you need to know. As a frontline physician, my patients are asking, what's the deal with the Delta variant? How is it different? How dangerous is it? And do our vaccines protect against it? Let's talk about all that. The Delta variant is the fourth variant of concern identified by the World Health Organization, and it's quickly becoming the dominant variant across the world. It was first identified in India, and by April had overwhelmed the Indian medical system. Since then, it's made its way into many other countries in Southeast Asia, crossed over into Europe, where it makes up 95% of cases in the UK, and is now in the US and Canada, where it's also becoming the dominant strain. But how is it different? The Delta variant has specific mutations in the spike protein of the coronavirus that enable it to bind to our cells more efficiently. This means that less of the virus can infect us, and infected people likely carry more of the virus around. As a result, it spreads about 60% more efficiently than previous variants. But does it affect us differently? All novel coronavirus infections share many similarities. But data from the UK, where people used an app to track their symptoms, suggests that the Delta variant is more likely to cause headache, sore throat, runny nose, and fever, and less likely to cause those traditional COVID symptoms like cough and loss of sense of smell. But unfortunately, studies also show that the Delta variant causes more serious illness, with about twice the chance of requiring hospital care compared to the Alpha variant. So not only does it spread more easily, but it also makes people sicker. Now for the good news. Studies from both England and Scotland showed that our vaccines work very well against the Delta variant. Two doses of an mRNA vaccine like Pfizer are between 80 to 90% effective, and two doses of AstraZeneca are about 60% effective. That's pretty good, but the problem is that one dose of either of those vaccines is only about 33% effective, which means in countries like Canada, where most people have only had one dose, there's nothing more important to stop the spread of the Delta variant than getting that second shot. But there's more good news. If you're vaccinated with both or even just one dose, even if you do get infected, you are very unlikely to need to go to hospital. 
protection from hospitalization is 96% after two doses of Pfizer and 92% after two doses of AstraZeneca. And even after one dose, protection is 94% with Pfizer and 71% with AstraZeneca. But what happens if you mix and match vaccines? For example, what if you had an AstraZeneca vaccine for your first shot and are being offered an mRNA vaccine like Pfizer or Moderna for your second shot? Well, the concept of mixing vaccines is nothing new. In fact, it's been studied extensively in developing vaccines against Ebola, tuberculosis, and even HIV. And because each vaccine stimulates a slightly different immune response, protection may be even stronger. Early studies from Europe using an AstraZeneca shot followed by an mRNA COVID vaccine do suggest a stronger immune response than two shots of AstraZeneca. So it's very possible that the protection you get by mixing vaccines will be stronger than the protection from two shots of AstraZeneca. But what if you're being offered the Moderna shot? Does that protect as well as the Pfizer? While both of these are mRNA vaccines, they both use the same part of the coronavirus to trigger an immune response, and trials so far have shown nearly identical results. So for all intents and purposes, we should think of them as two brands of the same product. It's like you're going out to buy a new black suit and you're choosing between Zara and H&M. They both look good, but the cut's a little different. At the end of the day, though, they both get the job done. And even if you wore the Zara blazer with the H&M pants, nobody would notice. It's the same thing with Moderna and Pfizer. Either vaccine is fine, and mixing and matching is fine too. The Delta variant is here, and vaccination is now more important than ever to prevent that fourth wave. If you haven't gotten your first shot, it's time to go out and get it. If you're waiting on your second shot, it's also time to go get it. And it doesn't really matter which vaccine you had for your first shot. What's more important is getting that second shot, no matter which vaccine, so you're safe from the Delta variant. Well, for many Canadians with summer upon us, the next few weeks will undoubtedly be filled with many happy reunions. But for those who have lost loved ones to COVID, there will not be such a return to normal. Bonnie Allen has the story of one grieving daughter. The pandemic has forever changed Elena Tuckanell's life. The 21-year-old buried her mother and grandmother beside each other in this Regina Cemetery. They both died from COVID-19. I'm totally different now. I know I'm not who I used to be. My mom's obituary, my grandma's obituary. Tuckanell had to say goodbye to her grandmother, who was on a ventilator, over FaceTime in October. And nobody was by her side. And um, nobody could see her. She had, to, she had to suffer on her own in the hospital. Then her mother was put on life support in April. This is my mom, Danielle Rose Porbear. She was only 39 years old when she passed away. Porbear was diabetic and undergoing cancer treatment when she contracted the virus. Tuckanow was at her side in the intensive care unit before she died and made her mom a promise that I'll always live on for her and try to be the best daughter that I can be. And she had tears running down her eye, <laughs> getting onto the ventilator. Poor Bear had nine children, and while most of them are in foster care because of her struggles with addiction, Tuckanow says her mom was her best friend. She's like the candle that lit up everyone's darkness. She just wanted to be loved, and she really was. She was loved by a lot of people. Tuckanow's grief is so raw, her fear of COVID-19 so intense, she's uncomfortable with the reopening plans. Come mid-July, people in Saskatchewan will be able to ditch their masks and do this. It's not normal for everyone, though. And that is something we should all be sensitive to, says this psychiatrist. You know, as much as a lot of us are, are ready to just... Um, forget this past year and a half and, and really get back into normal. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that for a lot of us, um, normal is not something that we're going to experience. I just feel like I'm not even ready to deal with society. I just can't process or comprehend you know every day you know going on with my days and stuff and going out in public it just it's all totally different now she wants to remind people the virus hasn't disappeared nor has the pain of so many who lost their loved ones 
Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Well, next on The National, an Ontario police officer faced a psychological evaluation after complaining of harassment. This report has destroyed my career. But she learned the doctor behind the evaluation might have been a fake. Welcome back. Our next story has an almost unbelievable twist that we caught on camera. As a rookie police officer, Kimberly Cataret was forced to undergo a psychological evaluation that questioned her mental fitness. Almost 15 years later, we took her to meet the doctor she blamed for ruining her career, but she found a total stranger. Here's Judy Trin with our exclusive story. I've never veered from wanting to be a police officer. I love working with people, knowing that I've made a difference. Yep. For Kimberly Cataret, policing was a calling. It was her job to protect the vulnerable, yet she didn't feel protected at work. It has taken her 15 years, but Cataret is now speaking publicly about her first year on the job with the Ottawa Police Service. As a rookie, Cataret says she was repeatedly harassed by multiple officers. In her diary, she documented how they pressured her for sex and made inappropriate comments. I started reporting it. I kept going up the ranks. After reporting the harassment, she says she was taken off patrol and put on desk duty. I said, I'm telling you what's going on, and now you're taking my gun away. Why am I being punished? She was ordered to see a psychologist named Dr. Ron Frey at this medical clinic. Is it hard to be back? It's very hard to be back. It brings back a lot of bad memories. Those appointments have haunted her since 2007. Cataret says she saw the psychologist in a small windowless office with no desk. They sat on folding chairs and there was something off about their hour-long sessions. He didn't care about anything, about my, the family issues. He was um, almost like he was condescending. Like it was, it, there was no concern from him. Cataret says the psychologist would just show up at her workplace. He would just stand there and stare. During their fifth and final session, she accused him of being an imposter. After that confrontation, Cataret says she was cleared to return to patrol. In 2007, Cataret was given a copy of a nine-page report. It was written on official company letterhead with the signature of an accredited psychologist. We tracked down that psychologist. You wouldn't mind just having a seat there? Dr. Ron Frey denies writing that uh, report. This is crazy because, quite frankly, I've never heard of anything like this. So it's distressing. Um, I I can't believe it's happening. Frey says he doesn't try to trigger paranoia in patients by showing up unannounced at their workplace. Go going in to try to trigger a police officer's um, alleged um, paranoia, as it's stated here in this report, would be something that would be, n a first of all, atypical and highly unethical. He also says his office had a window and plush chairs, not folding ones. But this actually takes it to another level because here, you, this is probably criminal. Frey is adamant he never assessed Cataret, so we brought them together. Do you recognize Dr. Frey? No. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry. Sorry about this. Definitely not you. Do I look familiar? No. Can I ask you a stupid question? Sure. Do you ever have a minivan? Never in your life? No. That's what you were driving when you used to come and meet me. A minivan? Yeah. Mm, I never had a minivan. Never, right? <laughs> Sorry. Someone impersonating a psychologist seems far-fetched, but Cataret's lawyer says they have information that can't be ignored. I was a bit cynical at the beginning, but there's a reason that we've stuck with uh, Kimberly uh, because, again, we have not been able to get adequate answers from the people who should be providing answers. Cataret's insurance records from the Ottawa police show only dental claims, nothing for a psychologist. People can manipulate. Uh, Her lawyers want an independent investigation. 
and something like this, this definitely needs an outside uh, body to take on the investigation. Ottawa police say they were made aware last November of a potential fraud involving a doctor's name. Initially, the force said there was no criminal investigation underway, but reverse course hours ago. Telling CBC, we take any of these types of calls very seriously. A criminal investigation will be conducted. Cataret suspects the psychological report is fake, but the damage is real. The report said she had partial paranoia. She fears that information was leaked out after she transferred from Ottawa to another force in 2008. I feel that this report has destroyed my career. We're 2021, this happened in 2007. And to this day, I'm still referred to at work as crazy and um, I can't be trusted. So this has never left me. After 15 years, this meeting has brought some relief. Cataret's worst fears were realized, but she was believed. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, as the country slowly begins to reopen, Canadians get back to what they've missed. The simple joys of returning to normal, next. Well, for many across Canada, this summer of reopening will also be one of reconnecting. And that's already happening for one particular group in BC, a family formed by Little League. One, two, three, black! Hi, my name's Angie DeFonzo. I live here in Coquitlam, BC. My son, Marcus, has been playing baseball with Coquitlam Little League since he was four years old. Hi, I'm Brian Turpin, and I live in Coquitlam as well. And my son is Benjamin Turpin, and he's played Coquitlam Little League for 10 years now. We never got a game in all last year. And then this year, it was just practice up till a week ago. And I'm lucky my kid is very interested in baseball, so he came back. But there's just so many kids that I think when they miss the two years, they're not coming back. I wasn't sure they were gonna loosen restrictions. And when it happened, we were, we were joyous in our house. There was a little uh, cheer and some high fives and it was great. Coming back was the best feeling because it was like we were missing um, family. Yeah. And the other piece of this was we've extended our family through the people that are the parents to these kids, the grandparents that come and watch, yeah. the siblings that are here. So it's just so great to be able to see everybody and to see everybody back and healthy. It's a great feeling. And when I came back and met the parents for the first time, it was kind of like that old girlfriend, you know, you just <laughs> pick up and start talking. It was, you know, I hadn't talked to him in a year and, and, it, and it, was, it was really good. It's more than just the game. It's, it's who these kids are to each other. They're still connected. These people will be part of their lives forever. The kids' mental health has suffered in this, and this is all part about the recovery of it, to get back to normal, right? Or what normal's gonna be, right? Love it. Okay, up next, no RV this summer, no problem. So we've graduated and then we bought the bus about seven and a half, eight weeks ago. Yeah, you heard right. How these friends decided to transform a school bus. Our moment is next. Well, these five friends had big plans to travel together once they graduated from university, but their plans, like all of our plans, changed a little and now they're hitting the road by bus. School bus, to be exact. They got a hold of one and turned it into their own custom RV, and tonight, their handiwork is our moment. We've been roommates for a little while, and we kind of wanted to do something fun before we, we moved on to our, our jobs. Uh, and we kind of discussed traveling around, but then, of course, COVID hit, and we couldn't really go anywhere. And our next logical step was to, to discuss buying a school bus. We bought the bus about seven and a half, eight weeks ago, and we've been pretty much on it nonstop since then. To be honest, we didn't have a whole lot of uh, carpentry experience, so it was a little bit of a learning curve for, uh, for everybody to kind of figure out how to, how to swing a hammer. And It's kind of surreal. We've been head down working as hard as we can for the last eight weeks to get it done. We started by stripping it down to a bare metal box. Uh, we took 
everything out of it, um, which, you know, every rivet by hand, which was kind of a, a pain. I would not recommend. Especially considering the year we just had, you know, we just spent the last 12 months sitting in our bedrooms doing school online. So the fact that we're getting out and experiencing something will hopefully make up for it. The plan is to go west. Uh, we're going to go tour Canada. It should be a lot of fun this summer. We're very excited to, to hit the road. So <laughs> I feel like I missed the, <laughs> the part of that between the pandemic hit and the next logical step was to buy a school bus. <laughs> but uh, hey, congratulations. That, that's really cool. This is the real deal. Uh, they've got a shower, kitchenette, sink, fridge, freezer, solar panels. That's amazing. That's the National for this June 29th. Have a great night and have a great trip.